Okay, so continuing on with points, lines, and polygons, chapter six. We looked at the basics about triangles and uh, polygons, and now we're going through the common fields that exist on each of these. So, uh, convex is our next field. And convex is, a, is uh, a description of whether or not uh, the polygons are well formed. And so uh, convex polygon means that the uh, area is all con contained. Uh, if, we, if you make a bounding perimeter around the outer edge of the polygon, that there's no missing space there, that the polygon's completely filled and covered. However, if uh, you draw that bounding polygon and find out that there's something missing in here, then we would call that a concave polygon. And the reason we care about that is the underlying graphics hardware, when it gets the triangles, uh, as, we, as we've said many times, we're trying to get things as fast and efficient as possible. So, it turns out that computationally, if you're drawing a large polygon and the uh, system is triangulating that, also known as tessellating that itself, it's uh, very much faster if it just does that without considering holes. For it to look for holes takes a series of different steps. So uh, that extra step right there of computing where uh, a missing internal polygon would be, since it takes time, by default, it's turned off. We assume that uh, our, our baseline scene has been structured in a way that will be as efficient as possible. So this is why if you do have polygons that have concave sides, indented sides like that, that you say so. And uh, concave means the opposite of convex, so convex would be false when that occurs right there. And so uh, it's a heads up to the, the graphics tool to not do that. Now you may, you may find if you test this out that it works just fine. Okay? Uh, the reason for that is we don't mandate how graphics cards work or how the software works, but we do set it up so that it can be as efficient as possible. So uh, it's very common when you have a concave side like this uh, that's unnoticed that it might look fine on your machine because the, the graphics hardware might be set up to do things a certain way internally by its software or by its hardware. Uh, it might be less efficient than is possible. And then the hole is not discovered until later when it's on somebody else's machine. One of the, one of the bad aspects of this is sometimes uh, uh, the hole might not just affect the missing part here, but it might affect some other things. We might get other aliasing or flashing. The behavior is unpredictable. Okay, so um, One way to avoid this, of course, is uh, don't go there. A triangle, by its very nature, will always be convex because there's no way to draw three points in any way that are not convex. So um, um, you don't always have that luxury, though, depending on the data you're getting and how it was structured. You may find this to be possible. So, if you do find holes in your data, one way to fix them is you go through and triangle by triangle, vertex by vertex, fix things. You know, tessellate yourself and correct it. Or, an easier way is you just go into the node and type convex equals false, and that's the flag, so that the browser does the right thing, takes the extra steps to compute, and make sure that, yes, indeed, they get drawn correctly 
in every case when you send it out. Okay, next field is crease angle. Crease angle determines whether or not uh, adjacent polygons are drawn with um, a smooth shading or sharp shading. And uh, this is pretty interesting. We start getting into the uh, just how is a polygon rendered or how a set of triangles are rendered in the machine. And, and shading is the notion that uh, you can use color gradations over edges to make the edges much less visible. Okay, this is why on some of the spheres that we've looked at or some of the cylinders, you can't tell that they're not perfectly round until you maybe look very closely at the perimeter or shift it to wireframe. Why is that? Because the shading uh, uh, of the crease angle is, uh, is making it a, a gradual change in color rather than this triangle is lit from that angle, this triangle is lit from that angle, and they're not uh, uh, the same color, and so you see that very sharp edge in between them. Okay, so uh, the way we do this is uh, we tell it, and, and the crease angle says uh, for any angle that's uh, less than the crease angle, it's not drawn with a crease. We, it forces smooth shading, and uh, if it's greater than that angle, then it will get a sharp edge. So an example of that might be uh, if we drew something like a, uh, a half a cylinder. Uh, so let me attempt to draw something like that. Okay. Uh, Here's a, a cylinder that's been chopped in half. What would we want to see? Well, we would want to see uh, uh, smooth shading all around here uh, where it's rounded, but we'd still want to see uh, sharp shading at the edges of the top, at the edge of the side where it's truncated, that uh, so that it looked like a very nice, I mean, a very precisely cut off half a cylinder. Okay, since uh, two triangles uh, that are adjacent that share an edge can't have an angle between them that's greater than 180 degrees, because as soon as you get to 180 degrees, the angle starts going down again. It works, it's, it's not, the crease angle isn't measured like a normal, it's just whatever the side with the smallest angle is. Uh, that's why the bounds on this are zero to pi for a legal edge. And, and you can take advantage of that to say, if, well, I set crease angle to zero, then uh, that's saying all my edges are sharp because any angle will be greater than or equal to zero. So that will force every single facet, every single shared triangular edge to get a sharp crease color. Uh, conversely, if we set it to pi, well, all angles are less than or equal to that, so, that, so the renderer will gradually shade every boundary regardless of how sharp it will and hide, at least visually hide from the user, the fact that those creases exist. Okay, uh, jargon check in there. I have used the term once or twice before, but uh, tessellation. Tessellation is when you take some shape and triangulate it. Okay, next field. Normal per vertex. We saw a picture of uh, normal calculations before. Let's go back to that picture. It's just a few slides back. Okay, and we saw that we calculate the normal by 
starting at the index coordinates, the order that they're referenced, the order that they're listed, and we go around and the right hand rule points in the direction of the positive perpendicular normal vector. Okay, so given that we know how to define and compute a normal, uh, some of the nodes, some of the geometry nodes allow us to define normals for every single polygon or for every single vertex, every single point used to define a polygon. Okay, so as you might guess, it's hard enough defining the triangle sometime to further compute the normals would be a big pain in the neck. Okay, and frankly, uh, most of the time we're not trying to use normals to be anything else that they are. In other words, if you have a triangle and you compute the normal, that's unambiguous. It's strictly defined. You, you're taking the plane perpendicular to that polygon. So this is why in X3D it's very rare, very infrequent that you might actually see normal data in there. Why? Because the browser has enough information already. It can compute all the normals and put them in. So ordinarily we don't have to worry about normals at all. They're just taken care of. There are some advanced rendering techniques that if we have a polygon and normals, we might apply different normals to get a special rendering, a special animation effect. Another uh, issue with normals is sometimes if you want something that loads tremendously quickly, there might be a might possibly be a performance boost by pre-calculating the normals so that the browser can just load the model, have the normals, and it doesn't have to pause to calculate every normal itself. Those are both really specialized techniques though and things we don't usually use. So here's the definition of how to do normals and ordinarily, uh, uh, and, and if we won't see this again until chapter 13 when we actually encounter the nodes, the triangle set, and the quadrilateral nodes that uh, take advantage of this. Yes, question. Uh, correct. In, in bump map, uh, texture, 3D, we might use those guys too. Right. Although uh, we don't yet cover those nodes, so those are one of the version texture 3D, uh, cube map, those kinds of things are, are in X3D version 3.2. Okay, next common field to all of these guys uh, is uh, the set of different uh, index nodes. Okay, so the pros seems pretty benign. We have indices that uh, are arrays, they're integers, uh, as with uh, other things in X3D, the count starts at zero, not at one. Zero is our initial value. Uh, that's a common graphics uh, convention. When we are uh, doing these, usually what we're saying is uh, the node will contain a pile of colors or a pile of points, and the indices are defining the connectivity between the actual shape you're drawing and the pile of points. The reason we separate these is to save space. If you have a complex mesh or even a simple cube, the adjacent polygons will be reusing points in there as you define each one. So let's take uh, a cube, for example. Here's a, here's a boxy shape. And uh, if we look at that corner right there, we can see that, okay, one, two, three polygons share that. So when we reference our set of one, two, three, four, eight points, eight vertices, and we define the connectivity information for each face, I would expect that point to be indexed three times, this point to be indexed three times, etc. Okay, We'll go through each one of these in, in a little bit of detail as we encounter them in the nodes. They're highlighted here because they do have uh, consistent definitions whenever they are used elsewhere. And um, 
also consistent to false. So uh, index is zero. If you're connecting points for the first one, you would use negative one as the sentinel value, as the flag that, okay, I've finished defining one set of connectivity, negative one, now here are my next indices, negative one, et cetera. That's how we get a long string of integers and distinguished where do we stop. Okay, default is empty array, so if you don't put that in, then nothing will draw. Nothing will be used. Okay, now uh, given that many of these polygons can be defined on either a per vertex or a per polygon basis, then our counting is going to be a little different for each one. Uh, if we're putting colors against uh, points, we have eight points. If we're putting colors against polygons, we have six polygons, okay? So color per vertex, normal per vertex, coordinate per index, excuse me, uh, uh, did I get that right? No, coordinate is always per vertex. So it's just color or normal uh, that gets applied here. Um, you can see the uh, difference in the definitions here. And so these are good checks to make whether we've done that properly or not when you define these guys. Okay. Uh, and interestingly, uh, interesting point here, if you make a mistake, what you get is not always predictable. And the reason for that is uh, because we're so focused on performance, we define how things work. We don't necessarily define how things don't work when you don't do it right. We would hope that most browsers are well behaved and would report an error to you, but you get on some pretty fuzzy ground after that. Should it try to draw things the best it can? Is it possible to draw it meaningfully if you haven't given it a good set of definitions? Is it better to draw something wrong and, but visible versus something not at all? These are all judgment calls. And so rather than try to mandate them, which would be a further performance overhead on browsers because now we're trying to tell them how to misbehave, how to, how to deal with broken content. Instead, we tend to be silent, and so we expect it, an error to be reported, but if it's not, there's still no guarantee of how it would behave. So uh, this is why it is so important to make sure your content is correct. Which, yes, question. Which nodes are these fields <coughs> associated with? Uh, these are, uh, in, in, in most cases, with the uh, index face set, face set and other nodes, uh, but we'll, we'll see them in other places too. You don't see, you don't see them like in the primitives? You don't know. Correct. You okay. don't see any of these nodes and, or any of these fields that we've described. The only one that we get that's in the primitives is uh, solid. So let's actually go back to that one and emphasize it. Because um, the primitives, we didn't have to didn't have to uh, do any work on. They're, all, they're already defined for us. We're not building them point by point, polygon by polygon. But it does share the uh, solid true. Solid again means solid like a brick. We don't expect to ever go in there and so it doesn't draw the insides or the back faces. That's how you can think of it. In, uh, in this book. So I'm going to add a little annotation in the notes for this slide uh, that this does apply to the primitives, but the others don't. Okay, so
let's say uh, go to the nodes. Okay, color node. When a color node is used by a parent node, some kind of parent geometry node, we get uh, values in there for each color and uh, those colors are then assigned via the index either to each vertex of a line or each segment of a line or each vertex of a polygon or each side of a polygon. Okay, so uh, color nodes are uh, very low level control. We can get all the way down to the point by point or side by side uh, characteristics of the geometry. Now you might well ask, well why haven't we needed this before? Answer, uh, material. Appearance and material is how we've been coloring things up to now, and material is applied uniformly, consistently over the entire geometry. Okay, so usually that's just fine, that's what we want. But if you want more precise coloring within an object, within the different facets, the different aspects of it, then we would start using the color node. Okay? Um, it's worth looking at the notes for uh, this slide. Okay, so we do uh, define them uh, in RGB, red, green, blue values, just as uh, is done in the material node. And notice uh, we've got a note here that says, if you do use uh, uh, colors, that you can put commas in there. There is a slight difference uh, uh, in X3D XML encoding and the classic vermal coding, uh, um, and that it's stricter in the XML.X3D encoding. Than you uh, otherwise seen otherwise see in the classic verbal. And that one allows uh, commas to go anywhere. Okay. Uh, some people don't like that. Some people say, well, I want my commas to just be white space. Why is it any different? And uh, as authors, we've seen time and again how if you have a long array of color values and the commas are in the wrong place, what became difficult to do, corresponding your colors to an index, which one was which, turns into impossible to do because you don't find the error. It might be that, oh, correspondence isn't the problem, it's, it's counting. You have one too many or one too few values. Um, uh, so this is why this game is a little bit tighter about it. Uh, since this game of validation is not required at runtime, it's not an impediment. If, if, you're, if your commas were in the wrong place, okay, it'll still run. But if you're trying to be an author with strictly validated, really uh, high quality, clean content, then, then this is a good thing. A later feature we'll see is uh, X3D canonicalization, um, um, and that is a reformatting. It's particularly used in uh, XML security things. If you want to digitally sign something, how can you make sure it's the same each time two versions aren't different? Well, canonicalization says uh, let's get a strict reformatting so that it looks exactly the same. So that will take out the commas because it defaults to uh, um, the most terse legal value. Let's take a look at that. Let's say uh, my file had some irregular spacing in it. Uh, if you want to test this feature you can just right click in the uh, context menu uh, context menu in the scene and we go down and find it. Okay, there it is. 
X3D canonicalization. I'll select that and gee, look at that. My scene's all prettied up again and all of that malform spacing has gone away. Okay, so as part of our preparation of the example archives, all the scenes do go through this uh, canonicalization process. By the way, this is uh, my favorite acronym probably in the whole world. Uh, C14N, very curious acronym. 14 in there stands for the 14 letters between C and N in the canonic word canonicalization. Okay, you see this in a few other places too. Uh, L10N is localization and there's a few others. So, um, geek humor. <laughs> but here we are. Okay. Um, sometimes you'll see RGB values uh, um, uh, in other places, excuse me, color values in other places, like especially uh, in HTML. Uh, uh, so I'll put a comment in there about that. So uh, zero through F, of course, are the hexadecimal digits, and we saw how to compute and convert those. Just about any uh, uh, HTML book will give you conversion values for that. And uh, actually, I believe we have a table in the book, too, uh, somewhere. I'll get that, and I'll put a reference in here. Okay, and then uh, here's, here's the answer to your question before. Gee, why haven't we seen these nodes or fields before? Well, uh, for color, color RGBA, uh, this lists the nodes that can contain those. And of course, if you use a color node, you wouldn't be using a material node, okay, because you wouldn't need it. You'd be assigning these colors right here. Okay, there's color. Now there's a almost identical node called color RGBA, and this is slightly different. Uh, all the RGB stuff is still exactly the same, but we also add an alpha component, opacity, meaning the opposite of transparency, to each one. So another uh, similarity back to the material node, where material node also had transparency, but recall that it was global for whatever shape it was applied to. Here with the color RGBA node, we can not only assign colors on a vertex by vertex or polygon by polygon basis, but we can also assign opacity alpha, meaning one minus alpha transparency to each face or each point and see what the rendering does. So we have really fine grain control of how we might draw geometry, how we might hide pieces, how we might do special effects of semi-transparency. Okay. Uh, the same comments hold true. Uh, uh, for color RGBA, it's almost exactly the same. And let's go through to the example now. And the example scene is uh, color dot x3d. Okay. Of course, I'm in the uh, chapter six directory. Okay, here we go, color.x3d. Let's look at our interface now for the coordinate node. Try again. Okay, color node, edit. All right, here we are, uh, uh, red, green, blue. Now, a nice feature in here is uh, not only do we have the three values, but we see a color 
uh, color mapper next to each one and those are selectable uh, so we can change the color using this and that's pretty helpful. We can also uh, uh, I think we can do a mouse over on these guys initially to see what it is. And then if you want to add points, add colors in there, you can do that. Um, I do have a couple of wish lists for this display and similar ones. Uh, to help editing even more, we're going to add an index column here. So we'll say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That will help you when you're assigning indexes, indice values, index values, or indices in the parent node. And the other thing we should be doing is, uh, oh yeah, uh, we'll, we'll make a up or down arrows on here so you can move your colors around if you need to. Of course, if you are shifting the order on colors, you would want to make sure your index was also correspondingly matching. But we'll do what we can to uh, facilitate good editing on this thing. Okay. And then uh, check one other thing. Sorry. Wrong one. Oh, I guess that does it. Okay, back to the slide. And you can see this uh, particular scene happens to be a little uh, uh, pump, a pump house actually in the kelp forest exhibit as we continue to build out our kelp forest and show those different examples. You can also see it in context with the other nodes that we're studying in this chapter the index face set and the coordinate node. I won't try to explain everything all at once, rather just point out that here is our color node and there are its values and that's how we would edit that. Okay, as with most nodes we have uh, uh, tool tips and I guess just for fun we could uh, uh, go in our editor and try to replace the color node and so let's drag and drop and right after the color we'll put a color RGBA and we can see that oh it does have about the same structure it's uh, it allows us to change color values either by type ins or by uh, using the uh, menu And similarly, we can do alpha. So alpha 1 means totally opaque, not transparent. All right. Next node, coordinate node. Um, Since this is so similar to uh, color, we'll go ahead and finish it up now and include it in today's session. Okay, so uh, the coordinate node is, uh, instead of RGB color values, it's providing XYZ coordinate values. So this is where we would define the individual vertex points of a polygon in 3D space. and. Uh, the type precision of this is uh, MFEC3F. Of course, reviewing our jargon, MF means multi field, commonly called an array. And VEC means a vector, also an array. But this vector has three Fs of three floats. So it's an array of arrays. The array itself has three floats each, sometimes referred to as three tuples. So any proper value in a coordinate node 
would have either 0 or 3 or 6 or 9 or some multiple of 3 sets of floating point numbers. Okay, so we build that up, we get to define all of the points in a polygon, each one would be an XYZ value. You might separate each one by commas to help readability. And then uh, outside the coordinate node, in the parent node is where the coordinate index defines the connectivity, saying which points are connected to which to go on a polygon by polygon basis. Since that index array is just a long string of, flow, a string of integers, it knows when one stops and the other starts by putting a negative one in between. Again, we have the same exact mechanism as with the color node. Also similar to the parallel nature of color, color RGBA, we have coordinate and coordinate double. Okay, it doesn't add a different term, but it does point out that uh, sometimes single precision is not sufficient. On some really high fidelity, high resolution models, we might want to use double precision. Past that, it's uh, exactly the same. It's also curious to note if uh, um, you want to get into the technical details that uh, double precision values, while they're certainly important and certainly necessary in some things like uh, geographic coordinates, for example, you need double precision to get a position uh, roundoff error less than about 10 meters on the Earth's surface. The numbers, nevertheless, at some point have to get truncated to single precision before they can go to the graphics hardware, because that's how graphics hardware is built. Shouldn't be too surprising since uh, we are so concerned about uh, performance. So what do these guys look like? Well, here's uh, an example of the interface. And uh, this is, again, looking in the same scene color. Notice, however, that uh, rather than having two uh, interfaces for you to enter the data, if you want to do it, we just simply put a checkbox there that if you mark it off, we'll write out the node back out as a coordinate double because uh, the ability to enter values is exactly the same. Also, like the other uh, interface, I'll want to add a up arrow, a down arrow, uh, for resorting these things and a column of the index values on the left hand side. That won't be editable, that'll just be a uh, authoring assist to let you keep track of which one's which. So perhaps by the time you see the next version of this slides, uh, even though the video today has this old interface, we'll probably have uh, fixed it. I hope so. And then finally, tool tips for coordinate and coordinate double. We'll take a peek in the scene to see if there's anything else. I don't think so. There's our uh, coordinate node. There's our editing panel. There's our point array. And um, there's our checkbox. Finally, as a look ahead, we can see that coordinate and color, the two nodes we just looked at, are here contained with an index face set. Index face set is a parent node that's putting these guys together. Sneak peek into index face set, we can see, ah, there's our color index, there's our coordinate index, there's all that connectivity. But instead of going there, we'll simply review where we're at in the chapter. Here we are. We've gotten up to here. And so next up is point set, line set nodes, and then on into the honest to goodness uh, polygon nodes, the workhorses the, where the rubber hits the road next 3D. And that's it for today. See you in the next lesson.